Lord God, we thank you that you gather us in your house this day to worship your holy name. But above all, we praise you as you have given us your son to die for our sins, sent him to the cross to pay the punishment for those sins, and raised him on the third day for our justification. We praise you as the Holy Spirit has come to lead us into all truth, to lead us into faith, and to gather us before your throne in heaven. And especially at this moment, may the words of this mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. I think we are governed quite a bit by this thing. Well, I have one on my wrist yet, and I have an old-fashioned one. My grandson asked me, Grandpa, how can you tell time? It's got hands. The one I used to have had no numbers. So I had to instruct my young grandson in the finer things of life. But we are governed by time and space. We look at various dates and times. I know that I must leave Sherwood at by quarter to eight in order to arrive here on time because I never know if I'm going to get behind people that are actually driving the speed limit. And there are the 17 stoplights. But we look at events. We see Thanksgiving coming. Christmas is approaching. Even though the stores have been telling, it's telling us it's Christmas for the last six weeks. We have those things that are always before us. The events, the calendars. Oh, by the way, I have an unsmartphone. It only is text and voice. But we also deal with the seasons, of course. But snow on Halloween? Uh, that'll happen, too. We would love to have our lives be lives of certainty, but we do know that uncertainty comes in. We would love to have our lives filled with our hopes and dreams and be able to plan everything out. But I'm not going to spend the next minutes talking about my phone or, our, or the weather. So I invite you to take the scripture that is before us in the bulletin today, and let's take a short walk, a brief walk. We must always be conditioned by the fact that God does nothing in a vacuum. No quickie surprises. He tells us what is going to happen, and then he accomplishes that. He prepares you and me as the people of God and the world for what is to come. And as we come to the end of the church year, the church just can't acknowledge December 31st, so we have to have these seasons at the end. And oh yeah, that first Sunday after Thanksgiving, new church year. But even as your bulletin declares on the front page, end time, we are conditioned in these last weeks by scripture that speak to the end times, what we are to expect and what we are to prepare for. But if we look closely at the scripture for today and actually all of them, it is not only speaking of a distant future, but what is at hand. So I su submit to you this morning, I'm going to repeat the phrase several times, first things first. First things first is God's plan of salvation. How does he declare that? We hear from the prophet Malachi who spoke 400 who wrote, spoke, oracle, 400 years before the coming of the Messiah. The revelation of the salvation that God had planned for all people. 
Please note, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Oftentimes we jump right away to the Mount of Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah were. But Elijah appeared much earlier. He was sent to turn the hearts of people to the Lord. His message was that people must repent. They must be ready to receive the Messiah. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11, our Lord Jesus identifies who this Elijah is. It is John the Baptist, and he has said, if you're willing to hear what I am saying to you, Elijah has come, and his name is John. You witnessed his baptizing. Part of what John then also did was to identify the Messiah, and as recorded in the Gospel of John chapter 1, John sees Jesus walking down the road and points to him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lamb taking away sin. Remember I said, not in a vacuum. God has prepared the people of that day and us today with a message from the Old Testament. The Lamb of the Passover. The blood of the Lamb that was poured out and painted on the doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over. The order of sacrifice that on the Day of Atonement, the blood of the Lamb in the Day of Passover, the Lamb would be sacrificed. And that blood then sprinkled on the mercy seat of God for the sins of the people. That is why our Lord said, I have to go to Jerusalem and die the week of the Passover. As the lambs were being slain for the Passover meal, our Lord was being slain on the cross. As their blood was being poured out and sprinkled on the altar, his blood was being sprinkled and poured out on that cross for our forgiveness. Now the promise of the Old Testament was this, that his body would not see decay. Note how often we have the speaking of a body, the very physical body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, become our own flesh, died on that cross, remained in the tomb until the third day, and then was raised by the power of the Almighty Father. So we see first things first. Salvation is secured for us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's settled. And as we read this scripture, we recognize that scripture, and this is a phrase that I saw someplace, scripture is timeless. It speaks across the ages. And it is also very timely and that portions of it will speak to me directly right now, as in... Christ died for your sins and was raised on the third day that is yours right now. And so we, we are directed to look at the end times. But again, first things first, what is the present danger and what might be the expectations as we look at the gospel lesson? It's almost as if Jesus is kind of just rambling. <clears throat> He hits on so many different things. I'm going to try to capsulize what he says in about two sentences. Not possible. Recognize that Jesus is now speaking at roughly 30 AD as we count to both the believers, that is the saints, and to those who are living in Jerusalem. To the believers, he specifically says, do not be deceived. Folks are going to come along and say, I am he. 
And in that way, the scriptures are timeless, and they are very timely. To this very day, probably this very morning, there are individuals who are claiming to speak for Christ, who are actually his enemies, and would want to deceive the people of God. Jesus speaks of the faith being challenged in very, very dynamic ways. Look out for your moms and dads. Isn't that one that gets in here? Oh. Parents, oh, look out for your brothers and your relatives. They will be deceived and turn you over, and some of you will die on account of me. And this will be an opportunity for you to witness. But Jesus says, don't prepare too much. In other words, don't be like a pastor spending hours preparing for a sermon. Because first of all, you have me. And if you have me, you have the Holy Spirit. And I will give you a witness that they will not be able to turn aside. You have that. Now he does speak to what is timely for those people. The temple would be thrown down. Stone would be tossed over stone. Everything beautiful would be tossed aside, and that would only happen in 40 years. But first things first. We deal with a fear factor. Satan can be so impressive and oppressive that he can push us into corners. And we can begin to wonder what the signs and wonders in the heavens are. There's more about that next week's sermon. But think of our brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone before us. Think of the Christians living in China in the 40s and the 50s and into the 60s and even to today. You better be carrying your ID card with you to mark you as one Christian. As has been testified before, more people are challenged for their faith and give up their lives for Christ in the last 100 years than in the previous 1900 years. We are challenged simply in this country. We're mocked. We're set aside. Your message is so out of touch. It just is in step with, with society. And we want to think, oh, can things get any worse? I might hope it won't, but if we listen to the witness of Scripture, it will. Things will challenge us even more deeply than they do right now. Whether in a church body, in this congregation, or in our own personal lives. But then, the Son of Man will come in clouds with power and glory. That's another promise. And if he promised to send this Savior, and he sent that Savior, and he promised to raise him from the dead and raise him from the dead, and he promised to send the Holy Spirit to create faith in us, 
we shall meet our Lord. In a really great way to understand is, today is the day of salvation. Today I may meet my Lord. Two weeks ago I received a phone call. My cousin was doing his farm stuff up north by Coleman and Pastigal, and the Lord called him home. He had time before the heart attack, heart attack took him. And the pastor sat there, new pastor to this congregation. And my cousin Dell, he was kidding to the very end. He was picking on the pastor for his great sermon. He couldn't help himself. And he was laughing and everything. The pastor kept saying, Maybe you should just settle down a little bit. You're having a heart attack. And Dell said, I know my Lord. He's with me now. And he'll take me there. As a country boy. Speaking the faith. Something that probably never popped into his head. But he was given witness at that point. But we will have that final day of, of redemption. I love how Malachi describes that. Pain for some. And you got, uh, this is lost, I, I'm, you know, you folks who have only grown up in this city don't understand leaping calves out of the pen. Grew up on a farm. And you cooped up those poor calves which started out, they gained 300 pounds while they were in the pan. And then comes the first day of spring and dad would open the gate. You never saw so much hopping around. I'm free. I'm free of everything. And that is what you and I, we're free of all of this that surrounds us now. First things first. Let's keep our eyes on the present time. The apostle reminds us of that. Let's recognize the dangers. Let us mark the evil. And it may even mean walking away from someone who is leading us in the wrong direction. We live in this present. Your salvation has come. The Lord is yours. So you and I, like the millions of other people of God, are worshiping his holy name today. We are singing his praises. We are taking our prayers before his throne. By your being here this day, you witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray the Holy Spirit be upon us to witness as we walk from these doors. Oh, and the little thing, catch the little thing that the Apostle Paul talks about at the end? Don't get tired of doing what's good. Continue to do that. So I say to you, visitors and members of Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church. Build each other up in God's word. Encourage each other in your mission because your redemption is drawing near. Amen.